Uh, so I will start the meeting then. I call this meeting to order. Welcome to meeting number 32 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. Today we have um, MP Stéphane Lozon, who's replacing MP Randeep Sarai. Welcome, bonjour, uh, bienvenue, uh, Stéphane. You're welcome, uh, Stéphane. It's nice to see you. Uh, so to ensure an orderly meeting, I'll just outline a few of the rules. Um, interpretation services are available to you. Just click on the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom. I, you should select the language that you would like to listen to. You can speak any of our two official languages uh, and interpretation will pick it up. Um, before speaking, uh, please wait until I recognized you by name. If you're, uh, well, everybody's on the video conference, just make sure that your microphone is unmuted before you speak. And once you're done speaking, just make sure that you are back on mute. Uh, and a reminder that all comments by members and witnesses should be addressed through the chair. Uh, with regard to the speaking list, uh, Mr. Clerk and I will do our best to ensure an orderly list of uh, speakers uh, when, when you're participating and you'd like to speak. Uh, now, before we go to our study on elder abuse, uh, we do have to approve the report from the subcommittee meeting uh, of Tuesday. Uh, so the report was distributed to members electronically uh, yesterday. Um, if there are no comments on it, do I have agreement of members to uh, carry this report? I see thumbs up from everyone. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now just very quickly um, in the subcommittee uh, meeting, uh, members will recall that uh, Mr. Clerk had undertaken to inquire about the status of translation delays for our committee documents. So maybe I'll turn it over to Mr. Clerk to give us an update on that. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, here's what I found out. Uh, the Translation Bureau now is currently operating at full capacity and has tried to get as much help as possible internally and externally. Unfortunately, it has not been able to always fulfill the usual translation delays lately. So at this point, additional delays may be expected depending on the context of our translation request. Like for instance, the complexity of uh, the briefs that the committee is receiving, their format and so on and so on. Good news is that the House of Commons, the Senate and the Library of Parliament are meeting weekly with the Bureau to talk about translation priorities arising from committee activities. So uh, as your clerk, I will make sure that if the need arise during the upcoming weeks, prior to the uh, summer recess, our priorities are, will be communicated at this weekly meeting. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clerk. I appreciate that update. Do any uh, do members have any co questions or comments? Uh, please uh, address them to myself and Mr. Clerk uh, uh, via email, or I'll, I'll be in touch with you as well if you if you do need to speak on this further. Um, so I would like to now welcome our witnesses uh, from the Department of Employment and Social Development. We have Kristen Underwood. Um, Mr. Garrison, is that on the previous topic? Uh, it's on the topic of our agenda for today, and yeah. I just have a question that when we're starting a new study, we normally hear from ministers, and I believe we issued an invitation to the minister from seniors, and I'm just curious about the scheduling uh, of ministers to appear before the committee, because uh, when we embark on a study, it's important for us to know what initiatives the government is planning and has underway so we can give a context to the study we're doing. So I am disappointed that we do not have the Minister for Seniors here today at the beginning of this important study. And I just wondered whether we have any uh, indication whether the minister does in fact intend to appear before the committee. Uh, thanks for that, Mr. Garrison. I will look into it with Mr. Clerk and uh, we'll get back to you with an update if that's okay. Um, so with uh, the Department of Employment and Social Development, we have Kristen Underwood, uh, Director General Seniors and Pensions Policy Secretariat. We also have Susan McPhee, uh, Acting Director General, Social Innovation and Community Development, Income Security and Social Development Branch. Uh, and from the Department of Justice, we have Carol Moranci, uh, who is the Director General and Senior General Counsel, uh, Criminal Law Policy Section in the Policy Sector. And we have Joanne Kleinberg, who is the Acting General Counsel, Criminal Law Policy Section, the Policy Sector. Now, I understand Ms. Oh, Ms. Moranci has made it, which is wonderful. Uh, so we'll go into our opening uh, statements uh, from the two uh, departments. Uh, just for your, um, 
just take note that I have this one minute remaining card and this 30 second remaining card that'll help you keep track of, uh, of your time. Uh, both of you have five minutes to make your opening st uh, statements. We'll start with the Department of Employment and Social Development. Uh, please go ahead, you have five minutes. Morning, Madam Chair. Just wanna make sure that you can hear me clearly. Yes. Terrific. All right, Madam Chair, committee members, I wanna thank you very much for the opportunity today to meet with you as you begin your study on elder abuse. Um, seeming like we're up first, so that's, that's great to, to, to start with us. So it's a pleasure to be here virtually on behalf of Employment and Social Development Canada. Um, as noted, I'm joined today by my colleague, Susan McPhee from the New Horizons for Seniors program. Seniors are an important part of our social fabric and contribute to the rich diversity of Canada. And that's why the government is committed to seeking widespread stakeholder views on seniors issues so that older Canadians can age with dignity while, experience, while experiencing the best health possible and social, economic, social and economic um, security. Elder abuse is an important human rights issue, as well as a social and public health issue that can undermine a person's quality of life, autonomy, dignity, and sense of security. Both men and women are, not, men and women are living longer and healthier lives than before and are projected to live even longer into the future. Seniors are the fastest growing demographic in Canada. In 2020, 18% of Canadians were 65 years of age or older, and it's projected by the end of the, 20, the 2030s, close to one quarter of Canadians will be 65 years of age or older. We recognize that elder abuse is, is a serious issue affecting many older people in Canada, and even more so in the context of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has contributed to further isolating seniors. Physical distancing around the COVID-19 pandemic has put seniors at increased risk of abuse since so many seniors are living in isolation and do not have access to their usual community supports and social connections. The COVID-19 pandemic has also highlighted systematic long-standing challenges in our long-term care system. We're deeply saddened and disappointed by the significant and disproportionate toll that COVID-19 is having on seniors living in long-term care homes and other congregate living settings. The Government of Canada values the many contributions made by seniors to our nation, and that's why the government's working to implement measures to help improve the lives of seniors and their families. Each year, the government provides $70 million in funding through the New Horizons for Seniors program, NHSP, to senior serving organizations across Canada. While one of the five objectives of the NHSP is to raise awareness of elder abuse, the overarching goal of the program is to increase the social inclusion of seniors. By increasing the social inclusion of seniors in communities, this can help us to reduce the prevalence of elder abuse as seniors face a greater risk of abuse when isolated. Funded organizations aim to address key issues facing seniors, such as elder abuse through projects that raise awareness of elder abuse, connect seniors with others in their community, and provide navigational support to help seniors find community resources and services that they need. Elder abuse can take on several different forms, such as neglect, physical, psychological, or financial abuse. These can have negative effects on older adults and their families. One of the most frequently identified types of elder abuse is financial abuse. And that's why the National Seniors Council, as part of their three-year work plan uh, from 2018 to 2021, examined and identified measures to reduce crimes and harms against seniors. To support this work, the National Seniors Council hosted an expert, expert roundtable and a town hall to identify promising practices and discuss new measures to reduce financial crimes and harms against seniors. In August 2019, the National Seniors Council published a What We Heard report based on their, their roundtables. It found that while the Government of Canada has a leadership role to play in establishing and maintaining policies, programs, and services that support seniors, other levels of government, community organizations, and the private sector are all vital partners in addressing financial crimes and harms, against, uh, harms perpetrated against seniors. The government is committed to raising awareness about fraud and scam-related activities. It does this through a number of mechanisms, including news releases, social media posts, and the Minister of Seniors newsletter. In the past year alone, the newsletter, um, the, the newsletter which engages close to 10,000 seniors and stakeholders across Canada, has covered themes such as fraud and scams. The government's committed to strengthening the approach to elder abuse. 
uh, in the recent mandate letters of the Minister of Seniors and Justice and Attorney General of Canada, they stated that we will work together to strengthen Canada's approach to elder abuse, including to create a national definition of elder abuse, invest in better data collection and law enforcement related to elder abuse, and establish new penalties and, uh, in the criminal, the criminal code. This was also reiterated in the speech from the throne. Through all these measures, the government is seeking to improve the safety and security of seniors so that they can age with dignity in the best possible health. Of course, there's much more to be done. The government looks forward to continuing to work with stakeholders to support Canada seniors of today and tomorrow. Madam Chair, honoured committee chair members, I'm, I trust that, this, that your report will contribute to compa combating elder abuse and will support, support the government of Canada in future policy actions in this area. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Underwood. <clears throat> we'll now go to the Department of Justice uh, for five minutes. Go ahead, Madame Morancy. Morning. Nous sommes heureux d'être ici aujourd'hui. We are pleased to be here today to discuss the criminal law's responses to senior abuse and negligent and related efforts by the Department of Justice. Senior abuse and neglect is an issue of concern not only for the criminal justice system, but also for other sectors, including the health sector. It's also an issue for the federal and provincial territorial governments. As the community knows, the responsibility for Canada's criminal justice system is shared. The federal government is responsible for the criminal law and procedure and the provinces and territories are principally responsible for the administration of justice, including prosecution, policing, prosecution, and the provision of services and assistance to victims of crime. The delivery of health services and long-term care are also matters under provincial and territorial jurisdiction. Each of the provinces and territories has a unique approach to addressing senior abuse, such as through laws that address the abuse of vulnerable adults. At the federal level, the criminal code protect seniors against abuse and neglect through numerous offenses of general application. It contains a comprehensive set of offenses prohibiting various forms of assault, including threats of harm and sexual assault, as well as negligence-based offenses that prohibit failing to provide necessary care to seniors or providing necessary care, but in a significantly deficient manner. The criminal code also contains a comprehensive set of financial crimes, which captures financially motivated crimes specifically targeting seniors. These crimes include theft and fraud, which have very broad application and include specific forms of wrongdoing like theft by a person holding a power of attorney. There are also crimes involving a combination of violence or threats and property taking, such as extortion and robbery. The criminal code further contains sentencing measures that may be applicable where a senior is criminally victimized. For instance, under Section 718.2, uh, the following are deemed to be aggravating for sentencing purposes, where the offense was motivated by bias, prejudice, or hate based on age, among other factors, where the offender abused a position of trust or authority in relation to the victim, and where the offense had a significant impact on the victim, considering their age and other personal circumstances, including their health and financial situation. With respect to certain fraud-related offenses, the criminal code also lists additional offense-specific aggravating factors, including where the fraud involved a large number of victims and had a significant impact on the victim, given their personal circumstances, which includes their age, health, and financial situation. These aggravating factors would apply, for instance, in the context of a large-scale financial fraud that targets seniors. Recently enacted Section 718.04 of the Criminal Code also directs the courts to give primary consideration to the objectives of denunciation and deterrence for any offense involving the abuse of a person who is vulnerable because of personal circumstances, and this includes vulnerability due to age. Courts consistently treat senior abuse as an aggravating factor in cases involving criminal negligence, assault, and fraud. Justice Canada is also addressing senior abuse through program and policy related initiatives. The Victims Fund, for example, is available to provincial and territorial governments and non-governmental organizations to support projects that address the needs of victims, including senior victims. 
and recently made the amount of $1 million available for the development of upda or updating of public legal education and information materials to support victims of senior abuse and neglect. Our research and statistics division is also working with Statistics Canada and others to uh, study the feasibility and of uh, leading a study to explore the feasibility and the challenges of addressing national data gaps in senior abuse, including in reporting uh, senior abuse in long-term care. Uh, we expect that report to be available in 2022. I appreciate the opportunity to inform the committee about ongoing activities within the Department of Justice on the issue of senior abuse and neglect. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Morancy. We'll now go into our first round of questions um, for six minutes each, starting with Mr. Moore. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to all of our witnesses for uh, being here today to start off our committee study on uh, what is a very important uh, subject, but has become uh, even more important uh, over the last year and more visible. Uh, in the criminal code, um, there are general offenses for assault, for fraud, and emotional abuse like threats. And uh, in the Protecting Canada Seniors Act that was introduced by um, the former Conservative government, of which I was a part, uh, it implemented further protections for seniors by establishing sentencing principles that take into account age, health, and financial situations of the victims. Um, maybe, uh, Mrs. Morency, if you, if you could uh, expand a bit more on how defining elder abuse in the criminal code could build upon that act and establish further protections for seniors. I think this is uh, something that we all care deeply about, but we wanna make sure any actions we take um, will have a positive outcome. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, as, as was noted, the criminal code was amended uh, in 2012 to add that aggravating factor. Um, and one of the challenges that was discussed by parliament at the time was how to define senior. And certainly that was the, the, the interest at the time was to ensure that offenses that targeted um, persons uh, that in that category would be treated more seriously by the criminal law. And as Parliament uh, considered that bill, um, the, the way that it was actually enacted at the end landed on, uh, it was as introduced, but it landed on basically the person's vulnerability can be determined by a number of factors. Chronological age is an important factor to be sure, and that's one of the points that's listed in that factor. But it could also be a combination of other things, such as their health um, and their personal um, financial or other circumstances. So the, um, the aggravating factor as enacted in 2012 said to sentencing courts, look at all of those things together. A person who is 60, but combined with poor health and vulnerable for other circumstances could be just as vulnerable as a person who is let's say chronologically older, 85 other conditions. Mm -hmm. So that's how, um, that's how it was enacted. And I can say that when we look at court, uh, reported case law, the courts absolutely are giving um, specific attention to these factors. They do look at it as a form of general and specific deterrence. And they do look at the combined uh, personal circumstances of the victim to determine whether uh, or not that person was vulnerable because of those factors, in, as well as whether there was a trust of, uh, relationship of trust or dependency between the victim and the offender. Okay, thank you. Um, you had mentioned the um, financial offenses, and I, I think that, uh, you know, that is becoming so prevalent. And if uh, members are, are like uh, myself in our offices, we hear heartbreaking um, stories from seniors oftentimes about uh, being targeted for financial offenses. I know uh, we're all aware of the, um, I mean, I had a call the other night from someone saying I needed to press one because there was a, some kind of major problem and I just had to enter my social insurance number. I mean, this is happening on a regular basis and uh, it's happening 
And the reason it happens is because somebody is pressing one. Like a lot of us will just hang up now when we get those calls, but enough people are pressing one that that uh, seniors continue to be targeted and others. But I'm talking more about um, offenses that take place from people that know personally the individual, uh, people that are becoming in a position to uh, uh, of trust. Can you speak a bit to that, the, some of the typical type of financial crimes that are committed against seniors? Um, I can answer that question. Um, thank you. Um, I think that um, the offenses of uh, theft and fraud, which Carol uh, Ms. Morasi mentioned in her opening statements, um, are quite uh, broadly drafted and apply to a wide range of circumstances because the, there are various ways in which people can um, obtain uh, the financial and other sorts of economic resources of victims. Um, theft in principle is the idea of obtaining through taking without having authority to take. And fraud in principle can really be thought of as um, persuading through some form of trickery or deception, the victim to give you uh, their property. Um, in circumstances that are just marked by dishonesty in some way. Um, so the particular modalities of the way these offenses can be committed are not um, expressly set out through these general offenses, that they're more framed around um, the, the basic ideas of taking without permission or obtaining through some kind of deception. Um, and though there are in the criminal code um, a variety of other more specifically framed criminal offenses, uh, I think most charges that we see will fall under the rubric of either theft or fraud. Uh, and there can be a substantial amount of overlap between those offenses. So some forms of wrongdoing can be prosecuted uh, as both theft and fraud. Um, and in those particular cases, uh, the Crown may choose to proceed under one or the other. But those would be the main um, types of offenses that we would see charged in these kinds of cases. Um, even though there is, for instance, a specific offense of <clears throat> um, sort of uh, obtaining funds through the misuse of a power of attorney, um, even that form of conduct can be captured as fraud because that's a dishonest and unauthorized use of the permission that a person has um, that would equate to dishonest behavior. Uh, so I think that the, the predominant charges we see in these types of cases um, are likely fraud where there is some deception that takes place. Thank you. Uh, that leads. Yeah. Sorry, um, uh, Ms. Kleinberg, we're uh, over time here for Mr. Moore. Hopefully we can continue on this Thank you. Uh, with uh, Mr. Kellaway. Please go ahead. You have six minutes. Thank you, Chair, and hello to my colleagues and, and hello to the witnesses. Uh, an important study, to say the least. Um, my questions are going to be directed toward the uh, officials from the Department of Justice, Madam Chair. And First, a comment. Uh, the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, it highlighted the mistreatment of so many of our seniors living in long-term care. It was devastating to hear stories of the living conditions and treatment of patients. And as Canadians, uh, I, I think, and I know we're better than that. So my questions are this, do we have specific data regarding elder abuse in institutional settings? And how does this vary by province? As I mentioned at the uh, tail end of my remarks, this is one of the areas that we are working on to uh, get a better sense of uh, the data in the broader uh, context, including in the long-term care facility. So we're working with Statistics Canada on that. That said, um, the committee may wish to um, consider whether there are some officials from Statistics Canada who may have a bit more information directly germane to that. Um, and the committee may also be aware that um, a number of studies or commissions have been or are underway or recently concluded in at least uh, Ontario last week and Quebec is, has another uh, review underway as well. Um, so that would be a matter that would be beyond our responsibility, but there's certainly 
uh, I think two things. I think there is some data that is available by some of those other bodies. And two, I think we would all agree though, um, certainly that the circumstances of, of the continuing circumstances of the pandemic have highlighted the need to get better uh, data. And, and that, that was known even before the pandemic. Mm. Great point um, on that. So I, I want to continue um, with the Department of Justice. So as we work with provinces and territories to improve conditions in long-term uh, care, can you tell the committee if there are any regulatory offenses in the jurisdictions we control for long-term care volunteers that would be beneficial in eliminating elder abuse? And if so, what would that look like? That's for the Department of Justice. Uh, I will take a stab at this, but I just want to make sure I understand your question. You say regulatory offenses in the areas that we control, meaning uh, the, the Parliament of Canada. Correct. Um, well, I don't know that we uh, in the Department of Justice would be responsible for any such regulatory offenses. Um, our responsibility really being limited to the criminal code. If that's what you're asking about, I can address that. Yeah, uh, please just do. Just on the re uh, okay, so as far as um, the criminal code is concerned, um, again, Ms. Morancy mentioned um, the key offenses in her opening remarks. So if the um, mistreatment is in the form of um, unwanted touching, harmful touching, um, we have a full range of assault offenses that would cover that. But a lot of what uh, we heard and was reported on uh, that took place in long-term care was in the form of neglect. Um, so the failure to um, protect residents from transmission of disease, uh, failure to provide necessary hydration and nutrition in some circumstances, um, failure to deal with um, bed sores or other types of illnesses and injuries. Um, and so the criminal code does contain um, several offenses. The, the, the most important offense would be section 215 of the criminal code, which is the failure to provide the necessaries of life. Uh, that is a duty-based omission type offense, which means that it only applies to persons who have the legal obligation to provide the care uh, and where they fail to provide the care and that endangers life, that is criminally punishable. Um, so that is an offense that certainly applies in the long-term care con context. There's a more general version of a neg negligence-based offense um, called criminal negligence causing bodily harm or death. It has a slightly higher criminal law standard. So the, um, the, the behavior must be a marked and substantial departure from the standard of care a reasonable person would use in the circumstances for the context of criminal negligence causing bodily harm or death. And that, those offenses are also punishable by a higher maximum penalty than the offense of failing to provide the necessaries of life, uh, which has a slightly lower threshold. Uh, the departure from the standard of care need only be marked. Um, and, uh, but they do cover a lot of the same conduct. Um, so you would see charges laid uh, for both offenses in some circumstances. Uh, and that would cover both um, the failure to provide necessary care and also if care is provided but in a very significantly negligent manner that could be captured by the criminal negligence offenses as well. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, how much time do I have? 30 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna to try to get one quick question in. Uh, a 2009 report prepared by the uh, Department of Justice Canada Family Children and Youth Section noted the legislation using the terms elder abuse or elder neglect a rare, a rare rather, internationally outside of the United States. So two quick questions. Is that still the case in 2021? And what are the pros and cons of using such terminology in legislation or in criminal law? Well, just Very quick, briefly. Quickly, I'll just say that that report, the 2009 report actually was used to inform the reforms that were enacted by Parliament in 2012, that sensing aggravating factor, <clears throat> which looked at the, the range of circumstances. And, and my colleagues from uh, Ms. Underwood could also speak to that is one of the things that the government has committed to look at is how do we define and what are the variations and the use of terms within Canada policy outside of Canada, et cetera. So it does, it continues to be a variant. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Monsieur Fortin for six minutes. Uh, please go ahead, sir. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Madam Chairperson, my question is directed at Ms. Morancy. I'd like to hear what you think, Ms. Morancy. We have started to talk about the current provisions of the Criminal Code on criminal neglect and the failure to provide the necessities of life, etc. But how do you see the provisions of the Criminal Code as they currently stand in the context of a of combating elder neglect, be it uh, financial, uh, care-based? How do you see the current provisions vis-à-vis -vis the needs that are felt? Um, well, I'll take a stab at that. Let me say two things right off the bat, and I'll start continue in English. Conduct that arises that involves the mistreatment or abuse of seniors or elderly persons can be addressed in a number of ways. Could be addressed through the criminal code if it rises to the standard of some of the offenses that we've described. Conduct that involves treatment or um, of, for example, persons in long-term care facilities <clears throat> might also be addressed through provincial regulatory oversight. Um, and how how things proceed under one or the other may depend upon what is the evidence in a particular case. Could the police proceed more easily under one system than another? And maybe there are different standards that are at play. Um, my colleague Joanne uh, Kleinberg has explained on the failure to provide the necessary life and the standards that are applicable under the criminal code. Provinces under their regulatory oversight for long-term care facilities and the rules that are in play there would have different standards. At the end of the day, um, conduct can be treated sometimes under one or the other. Um, sometimes in the criminal law context, as my colleague has said, the same conduct might result in charges for a number of offenses, but ultimately it's going to depend on what, what are the facts and circumstances of each case. Well, as far as the criminal code is concerned, I understand that we won't be dealing with provincial areas of jurisdiction here. We're sure about that. But when it comes to federal areas of jurisdiction, it's my understanding. And by the way, uh, I really liked your introductory remarks. Could I have a copy of them, please, if that's possible, if you have no objection? be very helpful. But let me turn back to my question. Now, if we limit ourselves to federal areas of jurisdiction here, in your opinion, are the current provisions in effect in the criminal code and elsewhere adequate and up to the task to deal with the situation at hand? Or in your opinion, is it incumbent upon us to amend the current provisions or even enact new legislation or a special section of the criminal code? How do you see the lay of the land, of course, specifically sticking to uh, federal areas of jurisdiction? Um, chair. Secondly, um, I, I think I would just remind uh, the committee that the government has made a commitment to more specifically address the situation by explicitly penalizing um, the neglect of seniors in, in these situations. So clearly the government has committed to do more uh, to the extent that something is in place now and there is conduct at, in question. Certainly there are many offenses that we've highlighted and factors that are available to proceed in the immediate, but on the go forward basis, the government has clearly indicated that more, more will be coming. Okay. Now, perhaps one of you, I don't know which of you would be best to position to answer this question, but do you have statistical data currently on the number of cases of uh, elder abuse, either broken down by province? And as an additional question, do you have any data on whether or not uh, there are more crimes of a physical nature or more crimes of an economic or financial nature against uh, seniors? Uh, figures available. Perhaps one of you could uh, fill me in. Definitely, we do not have those statistics. But again, as I mentioned, the committee may wish to reach out to the um, Canadian Centre for Justice and Community Statistics, uh, Safety Statistics, 
with Statistics Canada, sorry, um, they may be able to provide you with more information, but they certainly have released a uh, Juristat on data of family violence in Canada from 2019. And in there, section four deals with some of the factors that you've asked about. Um, but we've also acknowledged in my remarks that we need more and better data in this area. And that's why we're working with our partners to get that. Uh, yeah, Vic. Now, with which partners are you working with? You say that you need more information on these issues. Is there currently a study underway? Yes, indeed, there is. We are working at the Department of Justice with Statistics Canada. I see, I see. And we're wait, awaiting the uh, next uh, results next year. And what will that data be about? Uh, will it be a breakdown of the various types of elder abuse, be it physical or financial? Framework to collect better data across the, the different categories. We. Okay. I see. Well, I'm sure I've almost run out of time, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monsieur Fortin. I appreciate that. We'll now go to Mr. Garrison for six minutes. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for being with us this morning. I'm going to ask the justice witnesses a question, but I'm going to ask them to bear with me a moment while I lay out a story that I think raises some questions about how we actually uh, respond to elder abuse. The story I want to lay out is of a private for-profit company providing services to seniors, a company that in narrow business terms is very successful. And in 2020, this company exceeded its profit projections by 40%. And as a result, it paid out more than a million dollars in bonuses to its top five executives, including a bonus of nearly half a million dollars for performance to its CEO. Now, what if I tell you that this company is a long-term care company it had revenues of $716 million from long-term care uh, and operated dozens of long-term care homes uh, in four provinces. And this company suffered a rate of death for its residents of about 3.6 per 100 beds. So nearly 4% of the residents in, it, in its homes died from COVID. In two of those homes, more than 20% of the residents died from COVID. And so, uh, I would also point out that in one of those homes, in one month, the home was cited for 13 violations of standards of care, including failure to provide adequate hydration, failure to provide uh, incontinence care, uh, and failure to provide uh, adequate nutrition. 13 times in one month while paying out a million dollars in bonuses to its chief executives. Now, the, the question I really have here is, Oh, certainly the witnesses laid out that there is criminal negligence causing bodily harm and the failure to provide necessities of life. Two aspects of the criminal code, which I think clearly apply in these cases where the company involved, and I don't name the company because unfortunately uh, you could name or I could name at least four companies with almost exactly the same story to tell during COVID. Yet I'm unaware of any criminal charges of any sort laid against any operator of a long-term care home when we have had certainly a vast proportion of, of the COVID deaths taking place in long-term care homes and a large proportion of those taking place in a second wave, which indicates there was a failure to put in place an adequate response plan, which to me would also qualify under Section 215 uh, as a criminal offense in failing to provide necessities of life, which would have required uh, hygiene uh, and um, infection protection measures, which were not taken in these homes. So my question to the Department of Justice officials is very specific. Have there been any charges laid? And, and if not, or if there have been only a few charges, who's responsible in our system at this point for charges being laid for criminal negligence or negligence in providing the necessities of life in long-term care homes during COVID? Um, thank you for the question. Um, I don't think we are aware of charges having been laid um, in respect of this or other long-term care circumstances. Um, 
we are certainly aware of, uh, on the civil side, a number of lawsuits that have been laid both against um, long-term care facilities and I think against provincial governments. Um, and uh, who is responsible? Um, well, I think the members of this committee will probably know that law enforcement is a local responsibility. Uh, so it would be for the uh, police departments in the jurisdiction where the alleged offenses took place um, to gather the evidence. Now, we don't know whether that is happening. It may be that there are investigations taking place and um, uh, but charges haven't been laid yet, or we haven't uh, come to be aware of them yet. Um, there may also be enforcement actions taking place uh, on the provincial regulatory side uh, that we are not aware of. Um, I think I think that's the the most that we could say about that. But this seems to raise a, a certain problem for me when the courts have specified that there needs to be uh, action both to deter and and to denounce. Uh, elder abuse. And if, if we're not uh, seeing these prosecutions, uh, now a year after it became clear uh, that that there were failures to provide necessities of life, failures to provide what was really needed, and we have no prosecutions, then there's no denunciation uh, and there's no deterrence. And in fact, what we're seeing now is it's being left to the relatives of those who lost loved ones to bring lawsuits uh, as a kind of deterrent factor. So it seems to me that this raises questions about how seriously we're taking elder abuse. And I'm not, I'm not sure. This is why I wish to have the ministers present today. I'm not sure that I can ask a public service to really, public servant to really answer that question. But, but I am concerned. Uh, and I do agree that our system says, well, local law enforcement. But in, there's something larger happening here that's probably beyond the capacity when it comes to companies who operate in multiple jurisdictions for local police to actually investigate the circumstances. Madam Chair, if I might just briefly, again, just to note, I, I think the committee is aware that the, the government has committed to, to, take, to go further with criminal law response to this. In the meantime, um, as, as my colleague has said, we're, we're not in a position to say to the committee that some investigations are or not happening. But if we were to be take notice of the report that the Ontario um, Commission released last Friday, for example, it does speak to many of the issues that the, the member has raised, including the fact for uh, further in investigation and review about how all of these things are playing out individually and collectively, right? Um, is it a question of timing? I don't know. We're not Thank in a position. You. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes your time, Mr. Garrison. We'll now go into our second round of questions. Uh, for five minutes, uh, Mr. Lewis, you're up first. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses. Uh, very good testimony once again. Um, this is a really important conversation. It's a tough conversation. It's been going on for quite some time, I do believe, but um, I'm listening, uh, listening very uh, very closely to the testimony and and I do have a few a few questions here because although it does fall under provincial jurisdiction to a greater extent um, this is something that I believe the federal government can help out with so to any of the panel um, what conversations have been had with provincial counterparts on what could better help seniors and what resources are required Who was that for, Mr. Lewis? Anybody on the panel that could answer my question, Madam Chair. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to the witnesses. Ms. Underwood, please go ahead. Uh, sure, um, Madam Chair, I, I, uh, I, I think I could talk a little bit about um, the, the work that the government has been doing um, uh, or the, the, the work that the government is supporting. Um, for um, the health standards organization and, and the and the CSA group who are working together um, on engaging a broad range of stakeholders across the healthcare system and the public to develop uh, national healthcare standards. So there is there is uh, work underway uh, around developing better standards in in long term care that will address both the safe delivery, reliable, high quality services and health infrastructure and environmental design in in long term in long term care. Um, that work is. is is, is ongoing, so I can't speak to the specifics of what's happening, but but there there is work ongoing in that space. 
Also, I, I should mention that um, uh, that the government did commit in the in the budget 2020 uh, to to uh, uh, propose funding for for the Public Health Agency of Canada, of $50 million over five years to design and deliver interventions that promote safe relationships and prevent family violence, uh, including elder abuse. So this is less in the in the institutional setting and more on the the individual space, but um, but I think that's important to 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 include as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, and sorry for the background noise. Um, so back to Ms. Underwood, what role can the federal government play to support further research, research on how to best combat elder abuse? To thank the federal government's role, um, uh, we we do need to stay in the in the space as as other members have um, uh, have mentioned today, Madam Chair, um, uh, including uh, the criminal code being in in our in our federal space. And I'll turn back to to, to Madam Aransi for for that for that uh, that discussion. Um, also, I think our role in supporting provinces and territories and looking at uh, looking at the the standards that they have in place um, in their jurisdiction. So as a, a, a leadership and support role in, in that space. Um, including and and uh, and and other funding to prevent um, elder abuse, as, as I mentioned. Thank you very much. Most Canadians believe elder abuse goes unnoticed, but when it is reported, how often is the abuser the abuser actually prosecuted, and what is the success rate for victims of elder abuse in the courts? Again, um, unfortunately, we we aren't in a position in the Department of Justice to collect that type of data. I do encourage the committee to consider reaching out to Statistics Canada for that. What I can say is when we look at reported case law, uh, we definitely are seeing um, so it, it depends. Not not all cases that are actually charged and prosecuted ended up being reported as case law. When we look at the reported case law, we do see more cases that occur involving abuse, um, sexual assault, neglect, fraud uh, than we do on, um, for example, in a long-term care setting. There have not been very many cases that we've been able to find. So to the extent that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question and definitely there is a strong interest to find out that connection, but I do think that um, that family violence report that I mentioned uh, to the committee maybe uh, or someone from Statistics Canada may be able to more directly respond to your question. Thank you very much um, to all the witnesses. And I guess I would, uh, I will certainly side with Mr. Garrison on this front. It would have been fantastic to have the minister here to answer our questions, but we do, I do appreciate all the witnesses. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lewis. I will now go to Mr. Lazon for five minutes. Please go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair. I will uh, share my time with uh, my colleague uh, um, Arif. Now, uh, merci beaucoup tout le monde pour uh, l'invitation. Thank you very much, everyone, for this invitation to join the committee. This is a crucial committee to my mind, especially with the study of elder abuse. These are very sensitive, delicate issues when we talk about uh, physical, financial elder abuse. Often it's uh, financial in terms of cash, but sometimes uh, those who mistreat our seniors steal uh, their assets, their belongings. There's also psychological and physical abuse. Uh, and unfortunately, it's sad to face this fact, but there's also sexual abuse. And this is a highly sensitive issue that I care very much about. But for a number of years, Statistics Canada has been gathering data on elder abuse. Now, the, there's a GBA analysis, uh, analyses which demonstrate that women are, of course, more vulnerable. And uh, do we know which seniors, are there particular age groups, for example, that point to who is most affected? and how women are impacted in comparison to men. Perhaps Ms. Morancy is best placed to answer that question, or anyone else for that matter. Thank you. Um, again, the 
Family Violence in Canada, a statistical profile 2019 report does provide some of that information by Statistics Canada. As noted, it, it talks in particular about violence against seniors uh, in at the hands of someone known to the victim. Um, but it also gives a little bit of information by way of comparison about stranger violence against um, uh, seniors. So um, I, I, I do commend that report. I'm happy to provide that report to the committee in English and French. It does provide some of that background. And yes, as noted, uh, women, mm -hmm. uh, who's more vulnerable? It can often be, and is often women are more vulnerable, um, but it's not only women that suffer um, um, elder abuse, senior abuse, and it takes a variety of forms. Um, you know, one of the challenges is getting better data and having it reported, and it's like domestic violence, uh, intimate partner violence. When it occurs in a private setting, it's often difficult uh, for victims to know can they report? Who do they report to? Who they can get help from? And that's why the Department of Justice is supporting additional uh, or enhanced materials, uh, public legal education materials for victims or potential victims of elder abuse to help them understand where they can go for help. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour... Well, thank you very much for your response. Now, I'd like to leave some time to Arif, but I have a crucial question that I'd like an answer on, if I may. 50 million uh, would be earmarked uh, in the 2021 budget to deal with elder abuse. So what can that money be used on? So I think, uh, Madam Chair, I think you, you, we need to talk to the public health agency specifically on how the money will be distributed. It will will um, support uh, the prevention uh, or it's intended to support the prevention of, of uh, abuse uh, in both um, in, in relationships, family violence, but also includes elders. Merci. Allez-y, Alif. Go ahead, Alif. Thank you, Mr. Lozon. Just very briefly, uh, I agree with the, the pro problem that's been highlighted by Mr. Garrison that uh, seniors in care have been failed during the course of the pandemic. Uh, but I also understand and know that we don't direct law enforcement officials about where and when to wear ch lay charges, and that's an important aspect of a democracy. So given that's the context that we are in, and Ms. Moran, see if you could perhaps address this, if we were to be minded to increase the tools that are in the toolbox for the laying of charges, given what's in the speech from the throne where it says explicitly penalizing those who neglect seniors under their care, putting them in danger. Uh, Ms. Moran, see, do you have any sort of suggestions as to how those improvements could be made to the criminal code. Thanks. So as, as and when the government moves forward with its proposals to amend the criminal code in support of that um, commitment, obviously we would normally and we would definitely in this particular case look to work closely with our provincial and territorial counterparts to enhance um, their understanding of what's being proposed, but also about the tools that exist already in the criminal code. Um, I do think all of us will be informed as well by um, new, um, new information and findings that are coming forth, including, for example, I've mentioned already the report in Ontario uh, from the uh, last Friday, um, which took... Um, like I would say in the moment, a type of a snapshot of what has happened so quickly during the first wave of the pandemic. I do think that as we at the federal provincial territorial table move forward to look at this, for us, it's in the criminal code context, criminal law context. I think we definitely would be looking to work with our counterparts to enhance awareness about existing new tools, what can we do to share information more easily uh, with each other? But I do think more will come to the forefront as we progress through and, and learn about other, um, even as, jo as my colleague has said, there are civil Thank lawsuits you. at play as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, that concludes your time. Uh, Mr. Verani, we'll now go to Monsieur Fortin for two and a half minutes. Please go ahead. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Now, Ms. Morancy. In the same vein, from your earlier remarks, I understood that there is a report that will be published by late 20, 2022 
on statistics, on cases and prevalence of uh, physical, financial and economic uh, elder abuse, but perhaps the current uh, legal framework might be reviewed in light of those figures in due course. But in the meantime, should I understand from your testimony that in your opinion, the prevalence of elder abuse is actually on the rise vis-a-vis -vis what it was to five to ten years ago? That is, that is my understanding from that report as well. The Family Violence in Canada Statistical Profile 2019 did conclude that there has been an increase in the level of violence against seniors, including in the family violence context. Um, absolutely, we do need better uh, and, and broader and disaggregated data, and that's part of what we're going to work towards to help us be in a position to better collect that data through Statistics Canada. Uh, but in the meantime, there is some data that shows what you've just noted. Okay. Are you agree to say that? Do you agree that if uh, cases do rise, uh, generally speaking, that the provinces will be in a bit of a pickle, won't they? In because the federal government, um, it's its area of jurisdiction, the whole legal aspect of this, but in terms of the care given to seniors, that's often a provincial area of jurisdiction. So there's a bit of a, a mismatch there. Is it uh, perhaps opportune that we recommend an increase in transfer payments fed from the federal government to the provinces to, uh, in fact, uh, compensate for these difficulties that seniors are facing. I'm not sure if my colleague, Ms. Underwood, wants to speak to that, but um, I, I would just say, I, as, as an official with the Department of Justice, I'm not well positioned to speak to um, transfer okay. of funds uh, dealing with quelques secondes. Well, I just have a couple of seconds left. Ms. Underwood, what are your thoughts, please? <laughs> no, me either. I really can't. So no one has money here? Uh, and it's not of interest to them? Well, this is something that is uh, important to bear in mind. I know that the criminal code is a federal area of jurisdiction, but from I, what I understand of your testimony, uh, care, which is uh, delivered by the provinces, is also facing in dire straits right now. So we need to help the provinces to deal with this increase in needs. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. Thank you, Ms. Monsieur Fortin, we'll now go to our last questioner for this panel, Mr. Garrison, for two and a half minutes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to stay focused on the crisis in long-term care, which has cost so many thousands of, of lives. But in doing so, I don't in any way uh, take away from the, the large problem of the individual cases of elder abuse that take place in our country. But I think uh, we have a responsibility to, to respond. So I'm going to go back to the question of who could be investigating and who could be working on laying charges uh, in cases which appear to indicate violations of Section 215 of the Criminal Code. Uh, and that is when, when um, for-profit long-term care companies own homes in more than one province, would it not be possible for the RCMP to do an investigation into conditions uh, and responses under COVID uh, of those companies because they cross provincial lines of jurisdiction. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular of one company, again, which I won't name, which paid $10 million to its shareholders during COVID, but spent only $300,000 on its COVID response plan in, in its, lo its long-term care homes. So uh, isn't there an aspect here that does become federal when these companies cross uh, provincial jurisdiction lines? Uh, and I'll ask again to justice officials. Uh, to the uh, justice officials? Um, I will try to answer, but um, with uh, apologies and respect for the committee, this is not an area that I think um, I have tremendous expertise in. But I think our understanding is that the crimes committed in the local jurisdictions are still the matters of the local police and that they would work cooperatively with um, local police in other jurisdictions where the same. Uh, or similar offenses have taken place um, by the same potential suspect. Um, I, I, it's not my understanding, um, but 
but I would um, recommend that perhaps you um, invite the RCMP to ask them this question. But it's not my understanding that because a crime may cross um, provincial borders, that that would give the RCMP enforcement jurisdiction. Uh, I, I would use the parallel of organized crime where there are sometimes special task forces uh, set up by the RCMP to investigate things. And when you look at the case of a long-term care company paying out such huge amounts in dividends to its shareholders and failing to provide the necessities of life to the residents of their care homes, this seems to indicate uh, a gap, I guess, in our system if there's no one who can look at that larger question of whether this in fact constitutes a criminal code violation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garrison. Unfortunately, that does conclude your time. Um, and I'll just take a moment now to thank uh, the officials for being here today and, and for your very compelling testimony and for answering our questions. Uh, we'll now suspend for a few minutes as we let in our next panel of witnesses. Thank you again and uh, see you in a few minutes.